here, and it's um, become increasingly important for the obvious reason there are a lot more uh, device and subsystem designs being done entirely in, the, in a differential sense. And a purely single-ended measurement with some caveats, which I'll talk about, um, can mishandle uh, some of that, that measurement, um, as we'll see. And there are a lot of different ways around that, and there have been for decades. The couple we'll focus on are some variants on using a ballon to make it into a, a pure single-ended measurement, and some direct measurements that explicitly capture correlation, which sort of follow in, in step with some of the earlier talks today. And what we're really going to focus on in this talk is, is some of the dominant uncertainty and sensitivity kinds of terms and how they, they behave amongst these different methods. Uh, a little bit of background on, on the methods we're going to consider and explore a little bit of, of the parameter space that's of interest. Uh, some of the calibrations and sensitivities are in play. We'll look at, at some of these behaviors um, experimentally, at, at least to uh, capture some of the some of the trend lines, look at that setup, and then work through at least part of the parameter space. We're not going to be able to cover all of it today. And the little cartoon in the top of, of this slide is really just illustrating that for an arbitrary amplifier with two outputs, you really don't know a priori what the relationship of the noise waveforms is coming out of those ports. They could be highly correlated or they could be completely uncorrelated. And that may or may not matter depending on, on how that amplifier might be used. If, if, for example, it's feeding a stage that has a lot of common mode rejection, uh, the level of correlation may not matter a lot. Uh, but if you're feeding some other kind of stage, it may matter. So let's just look at, at a couple of examples. Um, one is we'll start off just with a, a say, a two-stage kind of structure where the dominant noise source is something that's just two parallel amplifiers, which is, is done in, in some designs. So these are probably going to be quite uncorrelated. And the gain of the structure will have some common mode rejection, but the, the overall noise figure is, is a bit less it's interesting, so to speak. So plotted down here are just the common mode and differential noise powers, and we'll get to how those are measured in a little bit. And those are, are equal. The insertion gains for those two modes are quite different, as you might have expected from this front end. So that means the noise figures are quite different. But that, in and of itself, isn't really as interesting, since it's sort of just following a, a one over gain kind of relationship. And this kind of situation, just measuring essentially a single-ended noise figure and averaging it between these two is going get, to get pretty close. So that's fine. If things flip around where this first stage is dominant, and now it's a, a perhaps a different story, depending on, on the details of, of the engineering there. But what's plotted here is sort of the single-ended noise powers if one just measures each one of those and terminates the other port versus the differential and common mode noise powers that are now really quite different. And if one expands the, the differential noise power based on a mean square sum of, of the, the wave energies, one does get an expansion that looks vaguely like the average of the single-ended noise powers, but then you have this correlation term, and this has been published for, for many years. Uh, but that sort of uh, qualitatively suggests what is, what's happening in this, as this split happens. And this isn't a log scale, so the, the split here is going to vary as details of that correlation term move around. So how does one measure that if one does have to take into account what's happening? And of course, a, a use of a balance is an obvious choice. And one could treat this in a number of different ways. One could just say, OK, I know the SD1 for, depending on your nomenclature, uh, insertion loss this pass. So I can just de-embed that from the measurement and do your regular single-ended noise measurement, and then everything's good. And that works fine as well as, A, the, there isn't a lot of imbalance in this structure. and uh, B, it sort of depends on the statistics coming out of the dot. So there are ways of handling that, and that's also been published for, for a while, where one can essentially solve for that correlation term by knowing all the S parameters of this structure, as well as knowing the noise powers at a single-ended sense and the combined sense. 
And this is one expression of, of how that correlation term works. And you can sort of rationalize that makes sense if one goes back to this equation and you see, okay, you got a sum of the single-ended powers. And then if my bound is perfectly symmetric and everything, well, here you have the difference of single-ended powers. So those terms are all going to drop away and you're just left with this sort of combined noise power and the calculation all makes sense. But as the bound gets asymmetric or imbalanced, these terms are no longer going to cancel and you're going to get some, some differences. And there's yet another problem in that previous equation that made an assumption the correlation term was real, so there might be some effects of that and we'll, we'll talk about that a little bit later. This is a more complete term that requires both single-ended powers, the combined power, and then one other piece of information, which could either be a swap of these ports and another measurement or the use of an additional combiner. There are a lot of uh, different approaches that have been talked about for doing that. And then you might want to include the ohmic noise contribution of the bound as well, and, and that can certainly matter if the DUT gain is, is towards the low end. Another approach is to measure this correlation term directly, and this isn't new from a um, in an absolute sense, since a similar kind of topology is used in a number of phase noise measurement techniques. Um, but the idea is if you have coherent clocking and you don't decohere these noise waves too much, uh, then you can directly measure this. And of course, you do need an absolute uh, power reference plane as you do for all of these, and you do need a relative phase calibration plane there for that to make sense. Now, you can for both of these types of methods lose the coherence coming out of the dot if, let's say, for example, you have a cable or a transmission line that's very asymmetric between the dot output ports. And if that's long enough, any coherence you did have can get lost. And that may be what happens in system, and that's fine. Uh, you don't want it to be part of your, just your measurement scenario. And one little experiment here is where a zero and a three meter cable difference was inserted in this structure. And you got a differential comm mode power separation in both cases about 16 dB. And then add about a 10 meter cable length difference and that separation went down to 10 dB and that is correcting for cable loss and, and everything else going on. And what's, what was happening there is just lost coherence between those waveforms. And the bandwidth of, of importance is really the integration bandwidth of the noise measurement there. So the calibrations one needs. Uh, some of these are common for basically all the methods, like you obviously need your, your DUT gain and its match characterization for all the match corrections and so on. And the Ballon methods need the S parameters of the Ballon. All the methods need some kind of absolute power reference, even for a, a hot-cold scenario or just a cold measurement scenario, you need it one way or another. Uh, the direct methods are going to need a phase calibration, as we talked about, and a noise calibration to remove receiver contributions is needed for all of them, so there's a lot of global things in that list. So what are some of the sensitivities one might run into? Um, we'll start off with just measuring the S parameters, the bound, and any errors you make in that, what, what can happen. And it sort of makes sense that, yeah, if there's a, a significant phase error, and this is sort of large, admittedly, um, one can get some substantial noise power errors and that you're mischaracterizing how energy is moving between the modes. And magnitude error is a bit less. Uh, in a direct method, a similar kind of thing happens. The way I expressed it here was a little bit different in that I added a receiver Cal asymmetry. That introduces a second error and that now you're messing up the single-ended noise powers as well, so that slope appears a bit larger. An important thing with, with all the differential structures is the sensitivity to ingress, like a common mode signal being injected somehow into the system if it's purely differential. Uh, so if you have a, some kind of error in your phase characterization in the Ballon case, that can, can add to some increased errors in noise power if the ingress is large. In the direct case, it's a little simpler in that you don't have the isolation help from the balance, so it's, you're just overloading a, a noise receiver much like you would in a single-ended noise measurement scenario. And then 
sort of trivial is, is how added loss after the dut can, can add some sensitivities. And here it's, it's pretty simple in that if my DUT noise power is minus 100 dBm in some bandwidth and my absolute receiver noise level is, is scaling on here, what's the effect of a 1 dB error in that cow? And obviously as you add more loss after the DUT, you're going to get a bit more sensitive to that error. And that, that sort of follows logically. And it doesn't need to be a bound loss. It could be any other network you have. That sensitivity is going to start increasing in, in the same way, roughly. Oops. So to try some, some experiments to explore the, the parameter space, sort of create a, a synthetic DUT where we can play with the levels of correlation. It doesn't explore all the parameter space. We'll try to cover some other cases at the end. But sort of the idea is if you have a, a single amplifier here with a, with a bound and some phase shifters and variable attenuators so you can tune it frequency by frequency, you can get something pretty correlated to the output and pretty close to a, a differential output stage, in, at least in terms of, of that behavior. And conversely, if you make these attenuators small and make these large, now you have two sort of decorrelated amplifiers and you can explore that part of the space. This isn't the lowest noise figure structure, um, so it's not perhaps the, the best example, but for a broadband kind of thing, it isn't terrible, perhaps. And common mode suppression is about 20 to 25 dB in the case when this path is, is dominant. And this is just exploring or showing the who's the dominant path for a couple of the examples. To make the comparisons a little I guess easier to process, we're going to use the same DUTS parameters and receiver cows for everything and the same noise receiver. Use a broadband balance, which wouldn't be used all the time, of course, but it was, they are, they are commercially in existence and are using these kind of setups. So there's a fair amount of phase imbalance over about 30 gigahertz, 40 gigahertz of bandwidth, um, and a fair amount of insertion loss. It didn't affect the conclusions too much. We're going to use noise power in most of the experiments just to remove the noise cal from the situations. That's the least time stable of a lot of these parameters, uh, just to make it a little bit easier. So first example, of the low correlation structure. We had all the S parameters and noise parameters of the individual components. We can compute a nominal value, which is the blue curve. Uh, the direct and the full balance are in the B2 and direct lines, and those all agreed pretty well in this example. The simple de-embedding structure ignoring the imbalance was a little bit off, and that mainly had to do with our synthetic dot structure not being perfectly tuned. But those were all pretty close. When we go to a higher correlation level, the simplest de-embedding structure deviated more, as you might expect, and that's convolving a lot of um, of the common mode and differential noise powers, so the, the errors get a bit larger. More interesting, though not in a practical sense, but more in a uh, measurement sense, is looking at the common mode noise power for the differential DUT. And this is tough for all of the methods in that you're subtracting some nearly equal numbers so that you would expect the sensitivities to increase. Uh, and indeed they do, the, the differences from nominal increase and the repeatability went down in this, this particular measurement. Um, but the de-embed only balance structure deviated more than the others, again, as, as one would expect. Now, should clarify, this is measuring the common mode noise power, so what I'm calling a balance method, we substitute in a Wilkinson combiner to play that role and it was characterized separately. A slightly different kind of experiment, now we're going to change the attenuation ratio in this picture, so we're essentially changing the correlation as we move along this x-axis. And the, the direct and the complete balance again sort of track the nominal reasonably well uh, over that span. We introduced another method here, this B2A, which is that's that simplified um, balance method in the middle where we assume the correlations were real. And that's, as you would expect, somewhere in between in the agreement picture uh, as you got to the higher levels of, of correlation. Now that, that simple device only covered part of the um, 
the parameter space of possible device designs and not be able to cover all of them here. Uh, but this was a, a pseudo differential DUT that was presented um, by a collaborator at a workshop earlier this week, which is a single ended in differential out kind of amplifier where there was some noise cancellation of the differential mode being employed in the structure. And where this was being used, there wasn't that much concern about the common mode noise power since the following stages all had a lot of rejection. So the common mode noise power would be about 10 dB higher than the differential in, in this particular device. And although not completely conclusive since this was an unshielded on wafer environment in wireless bands, so there was a lot of ingress that, that wasn't being corrected. Uh, the result came pretty close to what the models were expecting. So that was, that was encouraging and some work is ongoing to do this in a proper shielded environment. Uh, so to summarize, there are uh, many different methods for looking at differential noise figure. We looked at a few of them here. They do tend to have very different sensitivity profiles. Uh, so paying attention to the characterization of subcomponents or paying attention to the underlying CALs can, can improve results in all of these. And all of them have a, a pretty big dependence on the DUT topology. Um, so understanding how that feeds into the constituent terms can, can also help. That's all I have. Thank you for your attention. Um, I think we have a few minutes for questions, if anyone's got anything. Um, I had one quick question. Um, I think earlier you had some uh, plots versus frequency for the, your different approaches. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering if. Uh, if you've been able to plot maybe the, the uncertainty bounds just to see how well, uh, I think it's what the direct method that was, if you had uncertainties on the direct method to see how well the other um, approaches compared, if they were within the bounds or not. Um, haven't put them here and have device specific uncertainties computed and at least for the complete bound and the direct, they, they ended up being rather similar. Uh, but we're working on a more more complete model, and would certainly be interested in help in working on a more complete model too. Okay. Well, uh, if there's no other questions. Uh, let's thank the speaker once again.